I will just say before we get into it, yeah, as Uja mentioned, there's a there's a new issue of the philosopher out, which um, me and John had the absolute pleasure of of guest editing. We think it's a, it's a great issue, a public philosophy issue about public philosophy, which is um, fun and the kind of thing philosophers like to do is get meta. Um, okay, so so an initial question, and and this is just to get the conversation started, I guess. Um, so in in your piece, Angie. One of the things that was very striking was this sense of urgency. So, so in your words, you you said the need for public philosophy is now very great, with issues like COVID, the war in Ukraine, many other things. And I guess as uh, this kind of reminded me of one of my the works of one of my favorite philosophers, which is Susan Stebbing, who wrote a piece of public philosophy thinking to some purpose a year before the Second World War broke out. And there she wrote, I'm convinced of the urgent need for a democratic people to think clearly without the distortions due to unconscious bias and unrecognized ignorance. And I guess my question then to get things started is how urgent do you think the need for public philosophy is today? How can public philosophy help with crises? Is it a stebbing thought by helping us to think clearly or is it something else? Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here and welcome everybody. I'm seeing people joining us from all over the world. It's fantastic. So many continents. You're very, very welcome. Uh, I think it's a, a number of things. So yes, so the stepping point, of course, we need clear thinking. My goodness, we need clear thinking right now. We need the analysis of concepts such as democracy, freedom, identity, culture, gender, uh, all these things which are so disputed at the moment. We need to analyse clearly. We also need to be able to analyze and both deductive and inductive arguments. We need to understand, well, what follows if I believe in X? What follows if I believe in Y? What, what are my ethical and other choices? So we, of course, we need all that. It's crucial. But that's not all we need, because I think it's, we often underlook, oh, so undersell the creative potential in philosophy. So it, because philosophy deals often in uh, hypotheticals, uh, in counterfactuals, uh, in the, the line I do in ancient Greek philosophy, very careful, uh, detailed interpretation of texts. All these things also foster our creative imagination and our mental suppleness. And we need that creative side too, if we're going to be able to suggest uh, some possible uh, ways out of the messes that we find ourselves in. So of course, analytic, but also creative. And, and philosophy helps us to think about, well, what, what would a, what does a good or an, a flourishing individual or communal life look like? Because until you've got some idea of that, then how do you know what you want your government to do in a, in a pandemic? Do you want it simply to save life or to save quality of life? How do you know what you want from AI and new technology? You, you can't answer those critical questions until you have some sense of what a good flourishing life might look like. Uh, just, just to push you a little bit more, I think, um, as you were speaking, something sprang to mind was how that type of public philosophy would, would play out um, in practice. So uh, I think... Um, especially the conceptual side, stepping outside of you and questioning your core beliefs and your, your pre-existing conceptual structures can be quite disillusioning. Um, and for, for a lot of members of the public, it's much more comfortable and easy to just follow your pre-existing biases. So is it through leaning on those creative elements that you've mentioned that we're going to encourage the public to start asking these questions? Or is it something else? Yeah, I think you 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 go in to people and you say, look, philosophy really can help you individually and in your community uh, live a more flourishing life in, in all sorts of ways. It can improve things for you. So, yeah, you have to give that positive narrative or why why would people want to go through what can, as you say, be quite a disturbing a process. So Socrates, of course, and Plato following him says a key part of the philosophic method is that you you question yourself, you, uh, you ask yourself whether what you've always believed really deserves your belief. That can lead you to 
realize that you don't know what you always thought you knew, that can be disorientating. But that stage of perplexity, what the ancient Greeks called aporia, is, is actually really important. Um, uh, it's a stimulus. It's, it's a stimulus to help us want to kind of search search more. But as you say, you, you can't just sort of plunge people into chaos and leave them without any kind of support. So yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to just to also pick up on on that, um, and and hopefully this isn't just asking the same question that John just asked. I mean, what, one comment on that is just to you know to mention Stebbing again. One thing that's that that she's really keen on is the idea of questioning our most cherished beliefs, right? The things that we feel really strongly emotionally about. Mm -hmm. She thinks probably other things that we should actually apply the most scrutiny to. Um, but I guess just this thing about the, the the answer you gave to the initial question. I mean, one could read that as saying, "Well, philosophers do do the theoretical work, do the ideal work, and then we then we ought to hand it off to somebody else to do to 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 get the things done." Um, does that sound right, or or or, is, or or are we kind of doing more than just than just setting out ideals that somebody else might realize, for example? It's not purely theory, is it? There's also, you know, the application of it. And for the application, I think you need philosophers to work with different sectors. So I've been doing a lot of work in the last few years with the National Health Service in the UK, uh, looking at, uh, I wrote an ethical review of a report they'd written on how to reduce access to planned care in our health service. I particularly looked at um, what ethical philosophy can say about how to prioritise waiting lists. So that's just one example. I do a lot of work with a fantastic charity called Refugee Tales, uh, looking again at indefinite detention, which to my mind, very unfortunately, we have in the United Kingdom, and how indefinite detention removes the, the ability of those detained to uh, act as ethical agents. So you need you need that dialogue. You need that synergy. You have to work with these different sectors. I do a lot of work with the World Economic Forum as well on the role of, of, of banks and business and, and in all sorts of problems, including in the pandemic and how to lead out of the pandemic. So each side needs to have some humility and listen and talk and have dialogue. Um, and it's it's not a case of philosophers standing on a mountaintop and being Zarathustra on a mountaintop saying, here are my edicts, I'm tossing them out to you, all you lucky people. No, you, you work together. Awesome. Yeah, that, there's some great examples of of um philosophy in the real world certainly um and and with that said who do you think should be producing public philosophy i, I suppose in, in answering was kind of especially interested to know whether you think more academic philosophers should be doing it and whether they should feel somewhat conscripted or obliged to sign up okay well i think that some academics should be doing it because I think, as I've been suggesting, I think it has real social value. Um, I don't think all academics should be doing it. I don't think all want to do it. I don't think all are particularly um, have the skill set to do it. Uh, so, but you need a few, particularly if your university is publicly funded. I think it's really important that you have a few people who can make the case about why your department deserves taxpayers' support. Not everybody needs to do that, but a few need to do that. I mean, of course, our teaching is an argument for why we need taxpayers' support. But if you can say, well, look, we can help in all these other issues, to again, to do with money, to do with new technology, uh, to do with what democracy means, to do with um, healthcare and so on, then that's an additional argument. Uh, now, you talked about conscription. Uh, ideally, no, of course not. Ideally, no. However, in the UK, and I realise a lot of people here are not in the UK, and you have escaped, hopefully escaped this, but in our every few years we have um, a research excellence uh, framework and one of the elements, and which 
partly allocates funding to to departments and well to universities but and it's not just the the academic research that gets assessed, but also what are called impact case studies. And in the UK, in our last uh, REF, um, each department had to provide at least two impact case studies, which was a big, a big task for smaller departments. So I imagine that in our university departments, there were a few <laughs> academics who did feel a bit dragooned into doing that. But ideally, no, you, you want the people who enjoy communicating, who who really have a, a, a passion for wanting to have that dialogue with people outside academia. I mean, just just kind of reflecting on 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 on, on a couple of points that have come up so far. I mean. Sort of thinking about maybe barriers, potential barriers to philosophy, having a having a wide public impact. I wonder, do you think there's kind of, I mean, I was thinking about this in relation to the previous question, particularly kind of, you know, one thing that's really striking about, about your work, Angie, is the amount of kind of, as you were saying earlier, the, your engagement with policy, right? Your engagement with that. And I don't think people necessarily think of philosophers doing that, but there are other instances, you know, Mary Warnock was, was working in with, with the government on, on, on policy issues as well. Do you think there's kind of a PR problem? Do you think people, you know, do you think we need to make a bigger deal out of the fact that philosophers do have an impact um, and that might have a knock-on effect? Yeah, I think I think we haven't always been very good at uh, telling people what we're already doing. I mean, there's a lot more we could be doing, but we're already doing a lot and we're not necessarily very good at telling people about that. So we do see philosophers more and more in the media and that in my, in my public work i divide it about 50% between media work and policy work and then in addition i do scholarly academic writing and i do my university undergraduate and graduate teaching uh so i completely agree um and in fact with with one or two other academics uh we are hoping uh, at some point in the next year or two to set up a policy and culture website to get to be a vehicle particularly to speak to uk civil servants not just the philosophy for the humanities generally because people in in government tend to know where to go to find scientists and social scientists but they don't necessarily know where to go to find uh, philosophers and other people in the humanities, and they don't necessarily know why they might need us. Uh, you know, but people in science can maybe save life, but hopefully those of us working in philosophy can uh, help the conversation about what constitutes a good and worthwhile and valuable life and how we can best live together and how we can deal with these really crucial issues to do with uh, democracy and how to protect it from being uh, subverted into uh, you know by demagogues or to do with good and and you know healthy and unhealthy ways of caring about your nation for instance so these in the pandemic we saw big debates about different kinds of freedom and freedom so-called versus care debates nearly always specious actually those freedom versus care debates were nearly always in fact false and could probably be untangled through looking at different meanings of the word freedom so there's lots and lots of ways where philosophy it can't wave a magic wand and fix the world's problems and it shouldn't overclaim but also i think it shouldn't underclaim and i i think actually the problem in philosophy is traditionally we've we have we have underclaimed what we can contribute so so long as we listen and show some humility and and res and respect and and enter into partnerships and in, into dialogue i think we can be a really substantive and valuable voice around the table well i think i agree with you that um it's through dialogue, really, that philosophy can, public philosophy especially, can show its benefit. I think, in um, in some of the literature I've read on public philosophy, a case is often made that philosophy is such a unique subject in that um, you can only really benefit from the value of philosophy if you engage with in, with it and understand it. You know, um, you mentioned some of the sciences potentially saving lives and things like that. And for example, I could I could benefit from biological research saving my life and knowing absolutely nothing about the underlying technicalities of that research whereas with when it comes to philosophy 
with with an example of say living a good life it does require a, a deeper understanding of of the philosophy behind it doesn't it um and i think you you obviously you're doing a fantastic job with all the work you're doing um to to try and take it to the public and and show its value um but just kind of returning back to that that kind of public benefit and just to push it a little bit more do you think it only has instrumental value um so value in so far as it the things it can do for us as a society or the, the critical thinking skills it helps us develop or do you think there's some value in public philosophy just for the sake of it Oh, definitely the latter as well. I mean, I think doing philosophy is fun and stimulating and enjoyable in its own right. I mean, Plato says that philosophy begins in wondering, in the act of wondering, in the Theaetetus, and and, and Aristotle says the same thing at the beginning of his his metaphysics. Philosophy begins in the act of wondering that everything is just so extraordinary and interesting. Uh, and again, if you uh, follow Aristotle on what he thinks uh, human flourishing consists in, he thinks it's the actualization or the, the fulfillment of different uh, faculties we have, our intellectual, affective, imaginative and physical faculties. So the practice of engaging in philosophy is certainly fulfilling uh, quite rigorously, uh, a lot of those intellectual faculties, and I would say a lot of our affective faculties as well. So, of course, it has really important instrumental value, but it's also really worthwhile in its own right. So, oh, no, completely. I, I would just want to go back to that question about dialogue, because there were two really kind of interesting strands, I think, in what you were saying, uh, because you were you were implying that technical you know academic philosophy is is technical and it's difficult mm. and to what extent can one do that uh with the general public and i think that's that's really an, an interesting question and i think honesty is the key thing here so yes academic philosophy can be very rigorous very technical demanding it can take years of training however so long as the professional philosopher is honest about that and doesn't pretend that what that you can become you know do this in a few days or a few a few months then i think there is still a huge amount of benefit to be gained from from walking around from exploring the foothills of everest if you like so the philosopher can say, look, come on in, come and come and explore the foothills of Everest and look, look how beautiful the view is that already is. And look how you know much is to be gained from that. And then if you want, I can take you maybe a little bit higher and it will get more difficult. And then maybe you'll overtake me and you'll go higher than me eventually and get to the top and tell me what it's like at the top. Uh, so. That's the key. It, we, we shouldn't pretend that public philosophy is to the same level of detail and technical precision and rigor uh, of the, the kind of stuff we're writing in our academic articles. But that doesn't mean that you can't get really quite a long way with it. Uh, as, so long as you're honest, so long as you don't make wild claims, so long as you don't set yourself up as a guru. I mean, that's that's my test. You know, the public philosophers should always allow themselves to be questioned and, you know, beware of the ones who set themselves up as gurus. Uh, so that I think is that was part of what I got from what you were saying. But also I, I picked up this notion of, of the importance of dialogue and doing things together. And I think that's so, to go back to your first question about why do we need philosophy right now? Look at the world. Look at the political and religious and cultural battles going on. I mean, tragically, literally battles right now. My goodness we need dialogue and sadly we see some politicians and some religious leaders and people in the media and influencers all over the world not using language to try to unite deliberately using rhetoric to try to divide deliberately cynically using words to try to divide people and philosophers can say okay let's start talking let's see through that cynical attempt to create division 
and philosophy can it not always but can often be best done in community in dialogue and i i would go further i would say that done well philosophy can help strengthen those communities and in some cases even create them because we're all kind of talking to each other online and that's lovely and we've all set up different little philosophical uh, chat groups about different areas of philosophy so that's another of the reasons why my goodness we need philosophic dialogue right now i mean I, I, one of the things i wanted to ask about is exactly on this anji i mean I guess you know this is a this is a question like what I, I'm a philosopher I like doing public philosophy so you know how, what's the best way for me to help and I guess the, the question you know in the UK but I don't think this is specific to the UK I, you know I feel that something that that can hold back good fruitful productive public debate is the culture wars right well, whatever that is whatever that means to people but maybe sort of as you were saying, Angie, kind of specious debate or, or or mass, you know, debate that looks like it's serious, but maybe there's, you know, it isn't really, um, or isn't as serious as it's presented, or it certainly isn't as serious as other things we could be talking about. Um, and I guess I kind of think, well, you know, I wonder maybe does public philosophy have, have the ability to cut through that in some way? Well, okay, I'd, I'd want to kind of, I want to let, let's unpack this notion of culture wars, because I think this is really important because quite often what are what are called culture wars and what what's dismissed as as woke actually there's there's often a, a really important ethical issue going on there very often to do with care and the degree to which uh we are morally indebted to those around us uh in our communities on the planet to to animals to plants so often there are actually genuinely important philosophical issues buried in the rhetoric which need to be unpacked and, and discussed calmly and respectfully and seriously what the cynical manipulation goes into turning those serious issues into often fake wars mm. so that there can be genuine disagreements so sometimes the culture wars do actually mask genuine cultural and religious and political differences but what the the rhetoric does of those who seek to usually to make money either money for themselves or political capital out of this rhetoric is to turn those sometimes serious disagreements into actual kind of wars and that's so what the philosopher can do is to say, look, this is the serious issue here. This is what we actually need to be discussing. And this is the rhetoric which is being used to manipulate you and is being used to make you feel that the differences between you are much greater than in fact they are. And your ability to resolve those differences through dialogue is much less than in fact it is because these people are trying to make financial or political capital out of you so so that's it's not that we should dismiss every topic that's currently seen as woke or part of the culture wars some of them are important topics but what we have to do is look at the the real ethical issue or the real political issue and get to that kernel and deal with that getting rid of all the sort of it deliberately inflammatory identity stuff which is laid on it by certain people in the media social media and politicians for their gain not for ours so that's that's what i would say there i mean i suppose i suppose one worry that 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 one might have or that i might have is that philosophers to so so yeah i think philosophers you know, philosophy can help us see the wood from the trees right what what, what where's the kernel of truth or or kernel of um, significance in something that might have been fl inflated in some way but you might think well in order to do that people already need to have some faith in philosophy or philosophers right so there's a bit of a worry of like um philosophy is only as effective as people think philosophy is worthwhile or important does that make sense as a kind of concern that, that somebody might have yeah, I mean, yes, if you know, we we have to just keep chipping away and not taking kind of abuse too personally and things, um, and just producing a good 
product mm. and and doing it in a way which shows humility which shows respect which shows cultural sensitivity um but also shows clarity and rigor and most people individually are much more reasonable than the people trying to manipulate us would have you believe sometimes when people get together uh they can be whipped up into irrational responses and behaviors but individually uh that's often not the case and i you know i'm encouraged because i deal with a lot of different sectors uh including in faith and interfaith and faith secular dialogue including in political dialogue i deal with a i you know i i meet people with a lot of very varying views and it's it's encouraging to me how often you can get people talking if you are if you show them the respect of having put in the research and prepared for the event um i mean aristotle says that if you're going to be an effective communicator you need three basic things you need what he calls logos your argument uh you need what he calls pathos which is an understanding of the psychology of your audience where they're coming from what they need what they want and you need what he calls ethos your own credibility and the qualities that you need to show are I mean, you need to show that you care about your subject and you're enthusiastic about it and you really want to communicate it and you really want to engage in dialogue about it. You also need, as we, we keep saying, to show respect and humility and the ability to listen and to use culturally sensitive examples. You need to show your audience the respect of having put in the preparation for whatever event you need a sense of humor uh you obviously you need clarity and accessibility and concision uh but so it, it you know in my experience i i can start talking with somebody who can initially seem really worked up and hostile but actually just sort of being respectful, listening to that and talking through and not everybody, but most people can be brought on board. And, and that gives me hope um, that we do have this wonderful thing called reason, which is not passionless. I, I'm with the ancient Greeks on this uh, in in. The, re the reason emotion divide is an early modern divide. You don't get it in ancient Greek philosophy. You get a difference between rational and irrational emotions there. And we have the ability to think outside our genes and our environment, our genetic and environmental inheritance. Now, OK, there's a chicken and egg problem here a bit. You can say, well, you can only think think outside your environment to the extent that your reason has been trained and that's partly going to be a matter of your environment i accept that but we can still i think make incremental pro progress we're, we're not trapped we're not trapped into the hostilities and the biases mm. that we may have inherited that makes sense you know philosophy really really can help liberate us to be better versions of ourselves and better versions of humanity. It, it not always, and there have obviously been some philosophers who've used their tools for for bad. Um, so I'm not naive, but it, it it really can help. Brilliant. Yeah. Um you articulated your point really well there. And I think I agree um with what you were saying that on a on an individual level, especially the, the examples you were describing we're kind of when one on one when you're in a room with someone and you engage in that dialogue. I think just shifting the conversation a little bit more to the online world. The next question I, I wanted to ask you was really what what makes someone a good public philosopher and what traits. But I think we can almost span that a little bit further and, and focus particularly on how they market themselves, because um, it could be the case that um, a philosopher's writing these fantastic pieces that are rigorous and they're brilliant and if they're read um they'll 
be a great tool for overcoming this manipulation and these fake arguments that are described. But the thing with public philosophy is we're trying to engage a disinterested observer. So academic philosophy very much so is people who are already interested in the subject. They're going to, they're, they're going to read it um, and they're going to decide for themselves whether there's any value in it. But in the public sphere, it's almost, we've got to try and capture their attention and, and prove our worth um beforehand and in in your article uh for the upcoming edition you kind of talked about this a little bit because you talked about um you know the use of music and visuals and games and things like that mm. um but really i'm curious to know whether you think those sorts of traits should should play an important role in how we measure the success of public philosophy should it be that measured on how many people see it for example Okay, well, you so there's a couple of really interesting points in there. The whole mar- so we'll deal with the marketization thing, and then we'll deal with how do you measure success. How would you even know what success looks like? The marketization, yeah, this is a very difficult balance. Um, I mean, to some extent, yes, of course, we're going out looking for for new audiences, and that's why we do television and radio and so on. But to some extent. We're also audiences are also coming to us. They're 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 good, you know, they're using search engines to find out areas they're interested in. And you've got to get a balance. Because yes, you've if you've got a good product, then you need to let people know about it and how it might help and how it might interest them or enrich their lives in some way. And to do that, yeah, you have to give attention to how you deliver it. Um what kind of uh, you know tools you're going to use you 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 say the word marketization i mean that suggests that philosophers make money out of this very few of us do very often we do these things for no money at all um one 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 might mention this evening and i'm delighted to be here but i'm certainly not being paid for it um but so let's let's say ad, publicity or advertising. Yes. Yeah, so, yes, you need to advertise your product. You And I do spend a bit of time on social media, on uh, the what was formerly known as Twitter, on X and so on. Um, but you, you mustn't get so distracted by that that you end up not having the time to create the good product. So you have to, first of all, create a good product before you then spend time. Uh, marketing it or publicizing it. So that that's really important. And then to get on to your second point about how do you measure this? Well, I mean, there's a whole issue there about whether we should be talking about quantitative uh, analysis in terms of the success of philosophy anyway. I mean, and this, this is obviously something that those of us in academia are involved in research excellence uh, frameworks and things have to think about i mean you you can look at numbers you can give in figures you can show emails and things of people who've written in to say this has actually helped me rethink a problem at work or i'm i'm a head teacher and i'm now got a slightly different syllabus in my school uh, you're look you're looking to see what kinds of change you've affected and or what kind of benefits and it's partly quantitative, it's part, it's partly qualitative. And as we know from the debate and utilitarianism between Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, as soon as you start bringing qualitative uh, criteria uh, into, into the issue, that you may well have a, a more uh, you know emotionally rich and accurate picture, but you've got rid of the, you know, the possibility of doing the maths. Uh, so I... <laughs> I guess if do people invite me back? That's one of the tests I use. If I've if I've done a piece of work for an organization or a media outlet, do they invite me back? Do they write back and say, have you got ideas for future programs or can you now look at this document? Um it's it's really hard to know. It's really hard to know. Uh but yeah, so. I would say always put your effort, first of all, into creating a good product and then think, what kind of tools am I going to use to market it? And how how am I going to put over these ideas in a way that's engaging and clear and concise and fun? Um, 
I use a lot of different stimuli. So I, I try to think of my public work, not as a replacement for thinking, but as an invitation to think, a stimulus for thinking, a catalyst for thinking. The thinking I hope will go on afterwards. You can only stop people off. Uh, and it, it can be words, of course, written or spoken, but it, it could be music, it could be a game. Um, it, it, it could be, I mean, video games has been really interesting work done in philosophy and video games. There's some really good video games, by the way, out there. So, yes, thank you. Thanks so much, Angie. And um, yeah, I love the emphasis on the product and also we'll we'll definitely invite you back. So um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we'll, what we'll do is um, I think we'll we'll hand over to Uja for some questions from the audience now. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, it looks like it's been an engaging discussion because we've had quite a few questions coming in. Um, I'll start off with a question by Brooke Maddox, who asks about how important do you think um, it is to have a transdisciplinary dialogue? So what they have in mind is about how it seems impossible today to think about situations like Israel and Palestine with just philosophy without taking kind of history and geography into context. And a little a related question from Isha is how are we defining philosophy? And if we're defining it as kind of concerned with abstract ideas, how is it helpful in more real life situations? Okay, shall I shall I start and then hand over to you and, and Peter John? So well, thank you so much for those two excellent questions. No, absolutely. I work with different disciplines all the time. All the time. So in the work I do on democracy, for instance, I'm really interested in its history from ancient Greece onwards. I mean, as an academic, I specialize in ancient Greek philosophy. So, of course, I'm interested in, in the history of it and the influence that uh, geography uh, has. So different kinds of expertise need to work together and listen to each other. I'm a big fan of expertise, but we shouldn't be in silos. <laughs> Uh, this the, the modern kind of siloization of knowledge is that again that did not exist in the ancient world. If you read Aristotle, it's it's all about everything. Uh, now the question: What is philosophy? Oh, is philosophy? Um, well, it literally just means love of wisdom, as we know. I I tend to think about it as as just asking those absolutely fundamental questions that get a topic going, uh, questions to do with, with essence and purpose. Uh, but uh, John and Peter, how do you, how, what do you think philosophy is? That's a really tough question, isn't it? Um, for me, uh, I really like, I heard a, a definition from Daniel Dennett in, in an interview on a podcast once where he said uh, for him, philosophy is what we're, what we're doing when we don't know what questions are the right ones to ask. Yeah, that's so excellent. Yeah, it's, it's part of it is clarifying, you know, what the right question is, and then using the, the tools in our kit really to 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 reach a conclusion together. Um, and I, I I think I agree. I don't think that can really take place in in isolation. Um, you know, there's the history of philosophy often depicts some of us sat on our armchairs and thinking on our own, and I'm not entirely sure much progress will be made. Um, these days on some of the especially the the questions that have really big societal impact yeah I mean just to to be brief so that so that we can get to some other questions I'm going to sidestep that really difficult question about what philosophy is the, going back to the other I mean the point about about philosophy and other disciplines I, I I absolutely agree and I you know just to give another quote from Susan Stebbing who you can tell is my favorite philosopher one thing that she said which I think is so true is she said it's persons that think not purely rational spirits and I think that that's great mm. I yeah. mean a good example of this is um and this yeah. is important for philosophers is you know I went to a talk last year which was great which was about whether arguments actually change minds right that's not on you know quantitatively that's not a question you can answer um for, with philosophy you need to turn to you know wherever you're getting your statistics from but I mean that's just an example of something that seems you know we have this assumption or intuition or just like methodological commitment to thinking you you, you get people to think the right things by changing their minds through an argument but, but what do you do if that if that isn't the, if that isn't in fact the case thanks very much um 
another question kind of going back to what Angie you were talking about about the history of philosophy and how it wasn't done in silos I think Catherine's question fits nicely where she's asking if you could speak more about the practice of philosophy over time was philosophy as a practice public at its origin and at what point do you think it ceased to be public and what were the causes Wow. Okay. I'll, I'll say a few brief things. That's such a great question, but it would take a couple of books to answer it. Well, no, I mean, in its origins in the West, so I'm not an expert in Eastern philosophy. Maybe some in our audience are, and you can put comments in the chat. In the West, it starts on the coast of Asia Minor uh, in the in the Greek uh, city-states there, the, the so-called pre-Socratic philosophers around Ephesus and Miletus and so on. And it seems to have been mainly public. I mean, Heraclitus would go along to the marketplace in Ephesus and he would compete with the, the rhetors reciting Homer and the politicians and so on. And it was, and if the crowd didn't like what you were saying, they'd just move on to the next stand. It was sort of like changing a television channel. You had to be good at communicating. Maybe one of the reasons that Heraclitus writes in such a... Uh, you know, these very pithy, uh, memorable, beautiful, witty aphorisms. Uh, and then you've got Socrates, who refused to write anything down, uh, saying he didn't know enough to write anything down, and he didn't trust books anyway, because you couldn't, they didn't answer back, and you couldn't really have a dialogue with a book. So he was tramping around Athens, sort of buttonholing the willing and the unwilling <laughs> into debate about what is justice or what is courage. Uh, Plato sets up his academy and Plato's academy wasn't just there as a research institute for philosophers. It was there to train future politicians and political advisors. It, it had a he re was really hoping at, at least at some stage of his career that there would be philosopher rulers. So he was always trying to bring the practical political world and, and the world of philosophy together. So its roots were very, very public. Uh, what happens? I mean, it becomes very, very technical in the Middle Ages and, and starts to retreat into universities. I mean, I love medieval philosophy, but it's really difficult and technical and that, that you need to really study the logic for quite a long time. Um, and but then there have always been some philosophers who haven't worked in universities and have probably done some, you know, done some great work outside. So what I'm trying to do and what a number of us around the world are trying to do at the moment in a way is get philosophy back to its its really very practical, engaged roots. John, Peter, what do you think? Yeah, it's a difficult. I mean, so I mean, I one of my specializations is early modern philosophy. And um, so this is kind of post Middle Ages, post medieval thought. And so we, so we had another event a few months ago where Peter Addison, Addison made the point that sort of there's a sense in which philosophy begins to be public then because it's not just in universities, but it's also a pretty exclusive minority of people who would have had the opportunity to you know, you know, as he put it, you have to be literate, you have to be of some means in order to get your own work published, and so on, and so on, and so on. So there's a sense in which it's, it's, you know, I guess it might be public, but it might not be very democratic, right? And I mm. guess that the, the things like social media, whatever we think of them, um, and, and the internet, and right, like, it, 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 it makes it, 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 the access, the pipelines are there much more widely, right? So, so that's yeah. Something I would so, so, sorry, John. I'll, I'll, I'll just something I want to add in because I can see we've got participants from all over the world, which is just fabulous. Something I really want to emphasize: there was a happy period of about three or four hundred years, uh, pre a thousand common era, really. So from about. 200, 300 common era to about 1,000, 1,100 common era. When Christian and Jewish and and then after, a bit later, Islamic philosophers and what they called pagan philosophers, i.e. people who still kind of had allegiances to the gods of Greece and Rome, who didn't think of themselves as pagan, of course. Uh, they thought the new Christians were the atheists. So anyway, they were all... They were in communication with each other. They were writing to each other. I mean, the reason we have 
Aristotle and the Neoplatonists now is because of the work of Islamic scholars, mainly working in, in, in the south of Spain. Um, so their commentaries, their exegesis. So there was that happy period when people of different religions and none were in communication. It can be done. Sorry, John, I, I jumped in there. No, no, thank you. Um, you did a brilliant job of explaining the history of, of ancient Greek philosophy as well. So thank you for that. Um, I think from my perspective as well, just kind of trying to interlink everything we've we've talked about. Um, I think the public philosophy we we kind of consume in in this modern era is very um it's very one way communication, isn't it? We you know we listen to podcasts um and we read and and um things like that. And I think it's really what I try and do in my spare time is really get back to the crux of the public philosophy you've described, which is you, you mentioned earlier using public philosophy as, as kind of a catalyst mm. uh, for thinking rather than the, the whole hog. And so I, I really like um what the 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 modern pursuits like the philosopher's arms, where they go into pubs yeah. and they just talk about philosophy. And I think really if if we wanna the modern equivalent of what that uh, the thinkers are doing in the marketplace is just to do things like that isn't it it's just to have these these ideas and just try and engage with people out in the public oh absolutely we, we have philosophy in pubs in prisons in homeless shelters um in schools of course in muses i mean i've talked in museums in art galleries in cathedrals um i've talked I have talked in a marketplace in Spitalfields Market oh. in London. I've talked on the top of a red London double-decker bus. So, you know, we are absolutely taking philosophy out there to places where people are and just saying, look, don't be scared. You know, we actually, these are issues that we all think about. Children are natural philosophers. We're kind of born good at this stuff. And we then have it crushed out of us I don't know um or we lose confidence so a lot of this is about giving people confidence to believe that they mm. okay no they're not going to sprint up to the top of Everest without some you know some training and some lengthy training and that would be false to pretend that but you can as I've said you can get so much out of exploring the foothills and then taking yourself a bit further up but you you need some you, oh, not everybody but you may need somebody to give you that confidence to start and that self-belief and and if you're in a doing it in a group in a in a pub or in an art gallery or whatever then that group can support each other or online there's a lot of great online groups of course I think that, that links nicely to what you said in your article as well, um, where you, you kind of reference this idea that, um, you know, it shouldn't be the case that academics are just sat on the mountaintop instilling knowledge <laughs> in a downward trend, really. I know. The truth is that, you know, even the best academic philosophers don't have all the answers, because if they did... Oh, my goodness, no, no, and no. So it's definitely, it's it's a mutually beneficial enterprise, isn't it, even to, to engage with the layman? I mean, I'm, I'm very clear in my head that I... Yes, I have a title, Professor of the Public Understanding of Philosophy, but I am really clear in my head that I am part of the public trying to understand philosophy better to help me negotiate my way through some of the really complex issues in the world right now. So I'm part of the public who wants to learn more. Uh, and I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm abs you know, really, really clear about that. <laughs> Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question. I think that's all the time we have, but I think to leave people with something maybe concrete is um, a question from Brett who asks, how can public philosophers help promote dialogue between antagonistic groups? And I know we touched a little bit on culture wars, but what about groups that just don't talk to each other? Um, how can public philosophy help bridge that, that gap? Okay, so again, this is again where I find my ancient Greek, my love of ancient Greek philosophy really helpful, because I often use an example from ancient Greek philosophy to get groups with very different political or religious views to discuss something in what seems a safer space to them because they can be dealing with an issue to do with the relationship between human and divine ethics but the divinity in question because it's 
an ancient, you know, ancient Greek gods, it's less threatening. They, they, it doesn't feel like their own particular religious identity is being challenged or threatened, but they're able to discuss very kind of challenging issues, but in at one remove, in a, in a space where they feel less threatened. Um, so that's why I, I do find ancient Greek and, and to some extent Roman philosophy, it's, it should be, it's a global inheritance. The same with ancient Chinese philosophy and other ancient traditions. People feel it, it can be a way into tackling really challenging issues, but people don't feel their immediate identity is being threatened. So I quite often use use that as a way in. Yeah, I think yeah on that I think one thing I'd say I mean I'm, I'm sort of sort of defer I defer here to to Evelyn Brister who's somebody who who works in field philosophy and one thing that that she says which I think is convincing is that philosophers are uniquely placed to do translation work so 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 yeah, we do a lot yeah. of this within philosophy right so so you, especially if you do history of philosophy okay it seems like you read something you think okay what they think they meant is this and then you communicate that to your audience right and I think that 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 seems like something that could be helpful in that role. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, I think I think that's such a good point. Um, but but we're back to what I said earlier. When you actually get people talking to each other one to one, whether it's face to face or in an on, an online discussion, people tend to behave a lot better <laughs> and and be a lot because they're, they're dealing with a human being and they can see they're dealing with a fellow human being. So it's finding forums where it's clear to everybody in the forum that it's just human beings in a room. It's just people in a room, whether it's a virtual room or a real room. And so much of the antagonism and anger falls away. I think I, I certainly agree with you both. And I, um, just to follow on from your point as well, Peter, I think, from my experience, that translation or perhaps that conceptual analysis where you you kind of evaluate in the terms that are being used is a really good way in to show the similarities between viewpoints as well. Because often it's, it can often be the case that there's a there's a disagreement via misunderstanding where people have incredibly similar views anyway. Um, well, ex exactly. Yes. I mean, that's so important that. Are people, you know, people think they may think they're disagreeing over the use of a term, but are they all do they all mean the same thing by that term? They may be at complete cross purposes. There may not actually be a disagreement there at all. So that, uh, yeah, that's what, you know, you and Peter are so right. That translation uh, skill, which philosophers may be able to provide is it's just so important. Yeah. 